Biodiversity Conference. Hope you guys are all having a good time. Our next speaker has worked as a researcher, conservationist, and a teacher. He has degrees in ecology, plant science, and entomology. He's written many scientific papers and publications, including his new book that he'll be signing copies of afterwards if you'd like to join him. Um, he is a husband and father of two sons who are with us, and the executive director of the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and the chair of the Butterfly Specialist Group at the IUCN. And he's here to talk with us today about the importance of pollinators in their habitats, something that's very dear to my heart. So, Scott Hoffman Black. Thank you all. Um, first, I want to do a couple thank yous. I want to thank Bobby here, who's done this incredible job with this conference, and thank the organizers, because it's pretty amazing to come to a conference of this caliber that's free. Uh, my whole early academic life was sneaking into conferences because they were too expensive. <laughs> You know, so I was thinking of sneaking into this one and then found out, wow, I don't have to. Uh, one, I guess I'm invited, so that's a good thing. But, but also it's free. To have something of this caliber with the speakers that I've seen so far for free is really amazing. So let's uh, give a hand to Bobby and all the organizers of, of this. Today I'm going to talk about pollinators. Before I do that, I want to do a couple other thanks because I like to get them out of the way. We at the Xerce Society would not exist if it weren't for all of our members. We are a membership organization, and uh, with membership comes privileges. You can find out about those in the back. You can get magazines. You can get timely emails. You can be involved in a growing organization that's doing great work. But some of our bigger funders are also the Natural Resource Conservation Service, who funds a lot of our pollinator work, the CS Fund, the Columbia Foundation, and the Gaia Fund, as well as Whole Foods, who, who did a project for us this spring and helped us uh, raise funds, as well as uh, get to people across the country who were buying food. I also want to thank all my staff, who I could not do this without, as well as the excellent scientists conservationists and farmers that I work with. So like to get those thanks out of the way. I would not be here without all of those people. I got to get used to this light here. It's shining, shining on me. I guess I'm in the spotlight. Some of you may not have heard of the Xerce Society. It's an odd name. Uh, it's, it's a name that's a little bit hard to pronounce. And I inherited it from when I took over the society 12 years ago. But if you can tell the story of the Xerce Society, it makes sense. We are the first organization to work on invertebrate conservation in the US and actually in the world. And we're named after the first butterfly to go extinct due to human activity in the United States. It's the Xerces blue butterfly. So next time you hear about us, you can say the Xerce Society instead of me going into a room full of people where they say, you're from the Exercise Society? What, what is that? So uh, um, we're the Xerce Society, and, and it makes sense. For those of you who haven't heard of us or, or have heard of us in the past, we're quite a different organization. We were started as a butterfly conservation organization. We were really quite small until the year 2000. Uh, when I came on, we had uh, about three staff people. We've just hired our 26th staff people. And we've really broadened our reach. We used to really mainly focus on butterflies. And now we'll work on, I like to say, anything without a backbone, except for politicians. <laughs> so if, uh, if you're an invertebrate and you don't have a backbone and you're in conservation need, we will take a stab at protecting you. Whether you're an endangered spring snail, where 20 of you can fit on my pinky finger, or our charismatic uh, megafauna, the monarch butterfly. Whether you're a freshwater mussel or a tiger beetle, uh, we will work for your conservation. And we do that, um, I shouldn't have gone quite this far, we do that really by translating scientific information so that we can use it to educate, use it to advocate, and use it to, uh, to really inform management and conservation on the ground. So our goal is taking science 
and making it applicable to land managers, farmers, gardeners, you name it, all of those people. And I came about this a little bit different, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful talk on uh, atrazine and frogs yesterday. I'm sure many of you were here. And that, you know, he's a scientist who felt that he really needed to get engaged because nobody else would get engaged. I was an activist who felt I needed to understand the science. So I went back to school to get degrees to understand the science with the goal of promoting that in conservation. Timely with this pesticide talk, we also have a large pesticide program working on policy, working on education, working on everything from protecting wetlands, millions of acres of wetlands are sprayed every year for mosquito control, uh, to our rangelands where hundreds of thousands of acres are sprayed with pesticides for cows so that native grasshoppers won't compete with them. Um, uh, we work on all of these issues and we inform these issues through science. Just a couple things for all of you folks, we also have a lot of citizen science programs. Go to our website, you can help us understand migratory dragonflies. Many people don't know that migratory dragonflies, or dragonflies migrate farther than monarchs do, all the way from Canada down into Mexico. And we have citizens all over the United States now starting to look at migration in dragonflies. We also have citizens helping us to identify sites for endangered bumblebees so that we can actually conserve those sites for the benefit of those species. But today I'm going to talk about the importance of pollinators and I'm going to talk about uh, the problems that we're seeing with pollinators and then I'm going to talk about what you can do uh, to help with this situation. Now, if you like life on this planet as you know it, you should think a pollinator. 85% of flowering plants require a pollinator, almost all of them insects. And if you like to eat delicious foods, you should again thank a pollinator. One in three mouthfuls, this is something that's bandied around, one in three mouthfuls of food and drink we consume come from a pollinator. Uh, I'm more like the, the better statistics, because that one's a little nebulous, but 35% of crop production worldwide is due to a pollinator. And most of the, uh, the plants that you eat that are vitamin rich, uh, with lots of minerals, come from insects. If you like berries, if you like most of your fruits, if you like cucurbits, if you like sunflowers, if you like almonds, all of these are insect pollinated crops. We could probably live without insect pollinated crops, but we'd be eating mostly bread and rice and corn. Uh, it wouldn't be a very satisfactory diet. And of course, I always like to bandy numbers. I go to Washington DC a lot and that's really, you know, they don't care about most other things. But when you can say that upwards of $27 billion these are what these insects are worth to the economy in the United States. 217 billion was the latest uh, number that came out for worldwide pollination. But I'm an ecologist. I do like to eat. I do like to let you know that these are animals are important for you, but they're also important for the other animals on the planet. The fruits and seeds that, uh, that pollinators provide are a major part of the diet of everything from game birds and songbirds to the grizzly bear. So pollination is just not, ju not just about you, not just about humans, it's about life as we know it on the planet. Now pollinators come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Uh, we've got, if you look at the, I guess on your, your side, it would be the bottom left. That's a wasp. Wasps do some pollination. Uh, not a major, uh, major, major pollinator, but they do some pollination. That middle lower picture is, is beetles. As you move to equatorial areas, beetles become disproportionately important pollinators. Uh, they do what's called uh, mess and spoil pollination. It's basically they're having an orgy while they're pollinating. Um, on the flower. A lot of fun, I'm sure. But they are extremely important pollinators of rainforest trees, especially, and other rainforest plants. The upper middle is a fly. People often don't think of flies as pollinators, but as you go to higher uh, elevations as well as higher latitudes, up to tundra, 
uh, flies become really important pollinators of forbs in tundra areas. So we've got butterflies on one side above and moths on the other. I love that uh, black and white moth. And it's, if you look at its shoulders, you can see that it's got, a, uh, it, it's got orange. That's a police car moth. I think that's a pretty cool looking moth. Moths are quite important, probably more important than butterflies in the scheme of pollination. They move more pollen simply because there are about 10 times more moths than there, than there are butterflies. But butterflies do move pollen, they do pollinate, although I like to call butterflies the gateway drug to real pollination. Um, they sip nectar, and in sipping the nectar, they move pollen. But really, when you think about it, and when you look at it in the United States, if you look at it in Europe, if you look at it for crops, if you look at it uh, in temperate areas of the world, bees are the number one pollinator that we have. Why is that? Bees are really the only animals that collect and transport pollen. Most animals are either drinking nectar or eating pollen. Uh, they don't actually move it back to a nest. Bees actually collect it, move it back to a nest. That They end up moving a lot more pollen and visiting a lot more flowers per insect. They also forage in and around a nest, so they end up visiting the same types of flowers multiple times and exhibit much more flower constancy. That means that they actually visit the same types of flowers. When they find a resource that is good, when it's good pollen and nectar there, they will visit that type of flower over and over. And as you know from your basic biology classes, pollination doesn't happen between different species. It happens between the same species. So these bees actually are doing much more efficient pollination than other animals. But pollinators are, are in decline. And I know you've probably seen newspaper accounts and other things of pollinators and their decline. Um, I'm going to take a step back because most of those news items that you have read are about honeybees. And the Xerces Society doesn't focus on honeybees. We focus on native insects. And honeybees, much to some people's surprise, are not native to the United States. Honeybees came from Europe. The first documented record of honeybees that we can find is from Jamestown. So they came very early to this country. Uh, they were brought by colonists for honey. They weren't brought for pollination. They were brought for honey. What a great way to bring your sugar with you. You can bring a hive of bees. Those bees collect pollen and nectar. They bring it back. They create honey. You actually have sugar. Uh, when you're an early colonist in the United States with the diet that they probably had, I, I imagine that honey was a pretty special thing to have. Also, of course, you got to have your mead. And without honey, you couldn't have your mead. You couldn't have brought that from the old world as well. So honeybees have been around the US for a long time. But honeybees were not used for pollination. Really, through most of the first several hundred years that they were on this continent, they were used for sugar. They're a great way to bring your sugar. But in the 1940s and 1950s, we did something new in the US, as well as in other parts of the world. We expanded our agriculture in huge ways. We created large-scale monocultures. This is a, a crop where there's just one species over vast areas. And we came up with chemical insecticides. These were mostly organophosphate insecticides. Those two things led to uh, basically the first uh, that we can find uh, issues with pollination of crops, which were in the 1930s. People started to see we're not getting our crops pollinated. And they looked then and thought, wow, the honeybee could be a great animal to provide pollination service. Just as it was a great animal to bring your sugar with you, it's a great animal because it can be boxed up, it can be moved from field to field, and you can provide a pollination service with it. It became really, really important to industrial agriculture as we know it because there was no habitat and we were poisoning the bees that were left. 
The problem was is that early on we started to see cracks in this system. Anytime you're using one animal, and in this case a closely related from a genetics point of view animal, for all of, all of the service you often see problems and this was the case with honeybees. Since 1950, before anybody was talking about this, we have seen a 50% decline in managed honeybee hives across the United States. Um, uh, 70 to 90% decline in feral honeybee hives. Pests, diseases, it, honey prices. China uh, is a big reason why we've seen a decline in, in honeybee hives. But one of the main issues is that varroa mite there. Imagine having a parasite on you the size of a small house cat that sucked your blood. That's what the varroa mite does to honeybees. And in doing so, it really lowers their fitness and they end up with other uh, maladies because of this large mite that infests their hives. That mite was introduced that we think in the late 1950s and was really one of the reasons why we started to see decline. But a few years ago, we started to hear something new. And you may have seen newspaper accounts of it. It was coined colony collapse disorder. Adult bees were suddenly disappearing from an, a hive. Basically, it was very mysterious. Beekeepers would go out to their hives, and all the adult bees would be gone. The queen was left, the brood, which are the babies, were left, but all the adult bees were gone. They had just left the hive, no trace of them anywhere. Well, of course, the queen and the brood can't live without the workers. So th it was a collapse. If, if you don't have the adults, you don't have a hive anymore. So we started, you know, we were already having issues with honeybees. Um, honeybee keepers were losing 15 to 20 percent of their stock every year pre-CCD, but in many cases that went up to a third of the animals that they had annually. Can you imagine producing a product where you lost a third of it in production every year? This was a serious, serious issue, and a serious issue for agriculture because of our mechanized agriculture and our large fields, we had come to rely on the honeybee for pollination. Now, I, I, I always do this part on honeybees because I get so many questions on it. Um, what is causing colony collapse disorder? Well, it's still largely unknown, but Marla Spivak, who's on the Xerces Society board, won a MacArthur Award for her work on honeybees. And what she would tell you is she really thinks that this is an issue of the straw breaking the camel's back. These were animals that were stressed. They had lots of diseases. They had lots of pests. There are many, many insecticides and other poisons in the environment. They've got a poor diet because we've eliminated a lot of habitat. They're closely related genetically. Um, other stresses, and uh, we probably ended up getting a new disease that came in that if honeybee hives were healthy, we may not be seeing these issues. But with the honeybee hives in the state that they're in, we started to see collapse. So honeybees are in trouble, and um, people are working on them to deal with these issues, but they are definitely... Uh, not a safe place to put all of the eggs in one basket for our pollination. So then we move to our native bees. Uh, the United States has over 4,000 species of native bees in, in several groups, but we don't really know much about decline in these species. Oftentimes we don't even know life history, we don't know distribution, we don't know population levels. The best studied group of bees is our bumblebees. There's about 50 plus or minus species of bumblebees in the United States. They're disproportionately important from a pollination point of view because they, they pollinate a broad variety of plants including many crop species, and they're uh, long-lived uh, throughout the summer. But you can see that bumblebees, from what we know, are not doing well in the U.S. Franklin's bumblebee is probably extinct. The western bumblebee has lost 
at least a quarter of its range. The rusty patched bumblebee in eastern North America has lost maybe 90% of its range. If you look at the western bumblebee uh, that we have been collected in Oregon from 1998 to 2001, you can see um, it is not pretty. We, this was one of the most common bumblebees in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, in the 80s and 90s one of three species or four species that you would find everywhere and is simply dropped out of the system. By the way, all those uh, red stars are from our citizen science project. We have had citizens who are really helping us inform conservation. And this is something that I was talking to Bobby about because the range of Occidentalis, the western bumblebee, comes down here you could be looking for this bee here. And it would be startling if you found it, and it would be really, really cool because this bee seems to have fallen off west of the Cascades. That said, the more people that are looking for it, the more we may be able to find and the more populations we may be able to conserve. Franklin's bumblebee is another bumblebee that uh, we have worked on. Franklin's bumblebee had a really restricted range in southern Oregon and northern California. It wasn't nearly as common as the western bumblebee, but it has also declined, and unfortunately we have not seen this bumblebee since 2006. So this bumblebee may well be extinct. Now, I showed you five bumblebees. It's only five bumblebees, but that's 10% of the bumblebee fauna that's out there. So you think of that when you're seeing collapses in 10% of the fauna, that's pretty large, and that's just the bees we know about. We can look to declines also by looking at butterflies. As I said, butterflies are not the most important pollinators, but they're mo very important animals, and they're actually really a good animal for understanding systems. Uh, they're oftentimes the canary in the coal mine. You can really understand what is going on with natural systems by looking at, at butterflies. And if you look at NatureServe data, uh, they've assessed all 800 species of butterflies and about 17 percent of butterflies are, are at risk. And that, you know, that's not, that's not good. Um, but what is worse is that there are lots of bumblebees that they simply have not captured that are very difficult to assess. Uh, in 2009, 2010, I gave a talk to a butterfly conservation meeting in Reading, England. I gave a keynote that I was invited to do. And uh, I am the butterfly chair of the butterfly specialist group for the International Union of Conservation of Nature. So they thought, well, bring this guy. He can talk North America. But I didn't want to do that just on my own information. So I sent out a questionnaire. Sent out a questionnaire to lepidopterists across the country, very smart people who are working on the conservation of butterflies. And I asked a series of questions. And one of the questions I asked was, what, is, what do you feel is the most important take home message for butterfly conservation? And eight out of 10 of these folks said, what should be of most concern is that we are seeing declines in our most common species. So these are not species on any list. These are species that are really common out there that everybody's seeing, yet we're seeing a lot less of those species. Eight out of 10. It didn't matter whether they were in North Dakota or Florida, Canada, Mexico, that's what we're seeing. And this is epitomized by the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is a very common butterfly in North America. At its peak, there were millions, tens of millions of these butterflies, maybe hundreds of millions, hard to tell. Um, the monarch, most people think of monarch butterflies flying from Canada down to Pine Forest north of Mexico City, as you can see in that eastern side of, of the, the, the map there. But Xerce Society has really focused on the Western phenomenon. We have our own monarch butterfly in the West. There is some genetic exchange, but that butterfly flies from the inner mountain West, from California, from Oregon, to a couple hundred sites on the coast of California. And what we've seen in using citizens to monitor these butterflies again, you can harness a lot of people to do a lot of work. 
But what we've seen is an incredible decline, more than an 80% decline in monarch butterflies. More than 80%. If you look at this graph, we've gone from an average site size of 12,000 to an average site size of under 1,000. It's incredible, and it's a collapse. Now, what are the threats? Just by the way, I'm bringing you down. Um, the first part of my talk is really, really a bummer. Uh, I promise that the second part of my talk will give you tools that you can take to hopefully help stem some of, some of these issues. So what are the threats to, to pollinators? Well, of course, habitat loss is the main threat to all animals on Earth. We as humans have built on the habitats that these animals need. And it's not just houses and green lawns, it's agriculture. As I talked about, the reason for a decline in pollination service is these large-scale monocultures. This is the same issue that was talked about yesterday. The reason we have to use atrazine, or they feel they have to use atrazine, is because we're not sustainably growing our food. We're growing it in 10, 20, 30,000 acre fields uh, often in the Midwest or in the Central Valley. And it isn't just the Midwest, it's the Central Valley. If you look at the Cape Valley, which is uh, just west of, of Davis uh, as you go up in the mountains, and you look at the, the picture on your right, which is the Central Valley, you'll see a big difference. And there have been good pollination studies, uh, studies looking at diversity and abundance of native bees in these systems. And you find native bees with quite diverse and abundant native bees when you have habitat for them. Kind of makes sense. Doesn't seem like rocket science, does it? If you don't have habitat, you don't. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, what's interesting, if you look at the Cape Hay Valley, they can get all of their pollination service, means they can get all of their pollination from native bees without bringing in honeybees because they have that habitat. Pesticides are another big issue. Uh, this was, again, yesterday we talked about atrazine, which is an herbicide. In my line of work, mostly what we're talking about is insecticides. We spray millions of pounds of active ingredient of insecticides across the United States annually. And as I was making the point in my question yesterday, the system for managing these pesticides is broken. It really is. And we need people out there trying to reform how the United States deals with approval of these chemicals, uh, as well as how we deal with when a chemical is truly shown to be problematic, how we take it off the market. But, you know, we've got mosquito control, we've got agricultural uses, but what many people won't, don't realize is there have been a couple good USGS studies that show that we use more um, pesticides in urban environments per acre than we do in many ag environments. It's the quest for the per perfect lawn. I want a perfectly green lawn, I don't want any aphids on my roses, so I'm going to use these insecticides. And what's really worrisome is that we've seen the rise of a new class of insecticide. These are called systemic insecticides, mostly in the class called neonicotinoids. They're, they're related and patterned after nicotine. Um, nicotine, if you smoke it, will kill you. Um, it also is an extremely good insecticide. You, so they've made new products that, that basically replicate nicotine in, in, in synthesized. And the thing about these that make them much more worrisome from a pollinator point of view is their longevity in soil and plant, and plant tissue. We have now found them in plant tissue for up to six years from one application, in soil for more than two years. They will transfer from a non-pollinated crop, you put it on the crop, you cultivate that crop in, and then you grow sunflower, and comes out of the soil without being putting any more on, and it'll be in the sunflower. So this is a new class of, of insecticides that could be having a pretty big impact on pollinators. As I talked about disease with honeybees, we are now starting to move bumblebees around. 
Uh, California is one of the few states that actually regulate the movement of bumblebees. So bumblebees can be moved into the state, you know, into the state for greenhouse pollination. Uh, and we've worked with Oregon to exclude all bumblebees from being moved into the state. But they're the only two states in the West that don't allow bumblebee movement. And we've got good evidence that disease is what's causing the decline in many of our bumblebee species. I know there's lots of uh, land management folks either studying land management, so I like to bring in a little bit of that. Of course, many issues that affect other wildlife affect uh, bees and other pollinators. Off-road vehicles can be an impact. Our meadows are often being encroached by by trees. Uh, pollinators use often the early seral stage, so as these trees are encroached in, um, they, they, they can cause real issues. This doesn't mean that you go out and do timber sales for pollinators. That's not what we're talking about here, but keeping the trees from encroaching into these early seral habitats is really important. Um, Natural wildfire can be, uh, have a big impact on pollinators, but also so can controlled burns. I'm doing a study up the road on the Martin Skipper butterfly up uh, near the border, uh, the California-Oregon border, and we burned half the habitat uh, looking at how the population of this butterfly fared under the burning regime. And after three years, what we found is that the burned areas, don't worry about this, this is a, uh, uh, probably a little hard to see from there. The red areas are the burned areas. The green areas, green areas are areas that weren't burned. We did transects in both those areas. But what we've found in the take home message is that the burned areas have not been recolonized. If we were to have burned that entire meadow, we would have extirpated the butterflies from this site likely. So uh, we need to think about pollinators in our management. This doesn't mean that we don't do controlled burns. I'm a proponent of controlled burns. It just means that we think about the consequences to all the animals, not just the butterflies, the ma or not just the birds and the mammals and, and other things. Studies also show that the abundance of butterflies is in direct proportion to grazing. Overgrazing, overgrazed areas limit butterflies. There are new studies coming out showing the same thing with bees, especially bumblebees. Bumblebees are really sensitive to grazing. Climate change is another issue. I told you this was going to be the litany of, of depression here. Uh, it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, we're just beginning to understand the potential negative impacts of climate change. Actually, I was reading a paper that potentially 30% of the species are going to go extinct due to climate change over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, some species are already moving to higher latitudes or higher altitudes, but not all species can move that far. Um, species like the Uncompagre fritillary, this is a butterfly that I worked on in Colorado in the San Juan Mountains. It lives here. It lives uh, only under year-round snow, uh, basically on the east side, northeast sides of, of 14,000 foot mountains. So with climate change, it will have nowhere to go. So it's a lot of people think about, oh, these things that have nowhere to go. Well, it's not just the high, by the way, this was the best job I ever had. <laughs> I got to hike around in these areas for the entire summer and study these butterflies. I, I, I can't quite ever replicate it. But the next best thing is working on the Martin Skipper, which lives in beautiful meadows in the Cascades. But just like many other pollinators, it's threatened with climate change as well, because it is a wet meadow obligate. We are seeing climate projections where these meadows could dry out. And if they dry out, we will no longer have those butterflies. So all the way from the tops of mountains to the middle of mountains, oops, to the coastline. There are a lot of butterflies and other pollinators that live right at coastline. This, the island marble, lives uh, up on San Juan Island in Washington and lives off of a plant that grows behind logs at coastline. If the sea rises and if we get more storms, which we've already seen some, this butterfly may also be doomed. So what do we do? What do we do? We've got all of these threats. On top of that, we've layered climate change, which is another threat. 
But the neat thing before I go on about pollinator conservation is that, as you'll see, anybody can take action for pollinators. I've worked, you know, I, I cut my teeth working on stopping timber sales, working on off-road vehicles, reintroducing wolves to Colorado, uh, worked on California spotted owl. Uh, those are issues that not everybody can work on. The neat thing about pollinator conservation is that every single person in this room can take action and I'll show you how to do it. That, that's what I find really heartening about, about pollinators is you can all take action in your own lives. To, to really protect these animals, though, we must protect, enhance, and restore resilient habitats where the plants that the pollinators need and the pollinators are able to survive and thrive. We do need to think about climate change as we, we think about these scenarios as well. Because to ensure that species survive doesn't just mean protecting a little habitat here and a little habitat miles away and another habitat miles away. These species may need to move over the environment. There's a great study that just came out in August on the Burnett moth. This is a moth that lives in the Alps in Europe. And they looked at two species that are very closely related. And one of them, they, they both, the data shows that they're moving up in elevation. And one of them had lots of obstructions. There were ski areas, there were other developments. They're seeing really big declines in, in that species. And in the species that don't have those obstructions, they're being able to move up the mountainside and take advantage of new habitats. So we need to make sure we think about connections and corridors as we move along. And we need to reduce non-climate stressors, such as invasive species, grazing, and pesticides. Is this slide about an invasive species or about pesticide use? Both, that's right. Um, I am really an advocate for not using chemicals wherever possible. That said, this is a grass species that was encroaching on the, one of the last habitats for the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, globally imperiled species. And without dealing with this grass, no matter what we did, we were going to lose this butterfly. So we have been doing some studies looking at both herbicide treatment and micro burning. This whole habitat for the butterfly, it's the largest known population, is less than three hectares. And when we took managers in to bring, pull that into five zones and we wanted to burn one-fifth of the habitat, they thought we were insane. But they got into it and they were really able to do it, these, these burn folks. And then we're doing some studies looking at herbicides as well. Um, to just try to, to save this imperiled species. So we need to look in ag natural areas, agricultural areas, urban, suburban areas. If we can provide broadly distributed habitats, we may be able to give pollinators the best chance of surviving climate change as we move forward. So what do pollinators need? It's actually fairly simple. Pollinators need forage patches. They need places to live, and they need a haven from poisons. It's, it's back to your basic wildlife biology. All animals need something to eat. All animals need a place to live. And they need a safe place to live. So uh, it, it's pretty simple. You can break it down into that. And all pollinators need nectar and pollen. I mean, that's why we call them pollinators. Uh, they have to have either nectar or nectar and pollen to complete their life cycle. So if you're trying to provide habitat for pollinators, you can do the best for them by basically having flowering plants from as early in the spring as possible to late in the summer. I think Peter was talking yesterday about the importance of early season plants and late season plants in your garden. These are probably the two most important time uh, when oftentimes plants are limited. But you want them through the entire summer. What this does is, remember I talked about 4,000 species of bees? You might have a dozen bees and a dozen species of butterflies living in your, if you're lucky anyway, living in your yard or in the habitat that you're trying to protect. By providing flowering plants, you are giving resources to the as many of those species as possible. Also, I talked about bumblebees. 
Bumblebees are long-lived, so providing resources throughout the season are providing for the bumblebee fauna as well. Now, I do want to take a step back because I got a call a few weeks ago about a manager who's working in the Midwest. This is not the Midwest, by the way. This is the Sierra. But working in the Midwest to, uh, on real prairie restoration. And they wanted to augment this prairie with pollinator plants. If you're really doing restoration, you should use pollinators. It should be a consideration but it shouldn't be an overriding consideration. You need to think, are there endangered species? What are uh, the, what's the ecosystem function you're trying to restore uh, at these sites? So pollinators can be a part of any land management decision. And in your yard or in ag areas, as I'll show you, can be the real reason you're doing these projects, but not in every landscape. Also, you need to think about resilient, plants that are resilient to climate change. We've just found this out, and we are, uh, we're uh, in the midst of a pretty interesting experiment that we did not know we were doing. We've plant had lots of new restoration and enhancement sites in the Midwest. And if any of you have been watching the news, the Midwest is in an incredible drought. We're basically seeing what is working and what is not. From our, from our plantings, which will give us an idea of what will work in the future as the climate changes. So think about res uh, resiliency. Think about drought-resistant plants. Think about redundancy in plants. The more flowering plants you can have in the spring, you know, plant three. Oh, can you plant six that flower in the spring? That's going to be better. If you get a disease in one plant species, you may have the other five still blooming and still providing that resource. Native plants are usually best. That said, uh, I know my wife would not let us have only native plants in our yard. Um, so uh, non-native, non-invasive plants can definitely have a place. A lot of our herbs, garden plants, as well as a lot of heirloom varieties in yards can be great for pollinator species. Next I'm going to talk about homes for bees. And they need to eat, they need homes. But when you think about homes, you need to think that you're not talking about a coyote, which is one species, or a grizzly bear. You're talking about dozens of species. And you do need to think about diversity. And there is an incredible diversity of native bees. Everything from uh, the large carpenter bee, which is uh, bigger than an inch, to this perdid, which is tiny and could fit on its antenna. Um, it looks like something out of a... I went to uh, the Great Beer Theater here last night. And uh, they had all these uh, old movies that evidently are going to be coming up, these horror movies. I think that that would be a great one. Uh, the giant bees coming at you. Um, I love beer theaters, by the way. It's nice to have one in your town. Uh, so, um, so as I said, there's approximately 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Most of you will recognize bumblebees. They're bumblebees, you know, they're hairy and yellow and black, and you, you will probably recognize our leafcutter bees. They look somewhat like a bee. They're striped. They might look more like a honeybee, but there are many, many species out there that don't look at all to, I guess, to the layperson like a bee. You know, everything from our metallic sweat bees that are beautiful green color that, you know, people might think is a wasp, to our osmia that are kind of bottle blue and I, I guess we're, we have oftentimes been confused as flies. These bees come in all shapes and sizes. Start looking out there and looking at your flowers and looking what's visiting your flowers and you're going to be amazed at what you see. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool world out there with lots of different species. But because we have so many species and we have so much diversity, we have a variety of nesting needs. These nesting needs can generally though be broken down, so it's a little easier, into three basic mechanisms. Ground nesting bees, tunnel nesting bees, and bumblebees, which are our only true social bee uh, 
in, in the United States, native social bee. So what most people don't realize is that almost all bees are solitary. They don't have a hive. 99.9% .9 of the bee species in North America do not live in a hive. It's a single mom. See, you can be helping the single moms out there if you're helping the bees. The guy, by, by the way, ladies, the guys in bee world don't do much. Uh, if you see a bee lounging on a flower and he's just kind of hanging there and he doesn't have any pollen on him, uh, he's probably just a guy waiting for the lady to come to the flower so he can do his business and be done. Um, so it is the females that really do all of the work and they do it by themselves. One female, if you look at this life cycle, the top middle, that's a female. You can see all of the pollen uh, gathered around its legs. It's collected that pollen with some nectar. And then what it does, this is a, a solitary ground nesting bee, but if you look at the uh, picture on the right, that is called bee bread. I love that name. She forms it into this substance uh, called bee bread, that is nectar and pollen mixed, and then she lays her egg on it. And then she will seal that cell, often with some type of latex, if they're ground nesting bees, so that when it rains, these cells don't get wet. Almost the entire life cycle of these animals is underground, unseen. Uh, 11 months a year at least, probably 11 and a half months a year, they're feeding uh, and then they're pupating. And you can see on the uh, upper left side that the, that's the pupa. And then they start over again. One female bee. This is the, also the interesting thing why a lot of people are scared of getting stung by bees. And most solitary bees either don't sting or are really adverse to stinging. Stinging comes from, and, and the reason wasps sting like yellow jackets, excuse me, and honeybees may sting if, if, you, uh, if they feel harassed, and bumblebees may sting if you really harass them, is because likely those are workers. They're expendable. They're thinking, we're going to defend a hive. If you get too close, we'll sting you, and we'll protect the queen, we'll protect the brood. If you're a single female and you sting and get squished and can't get back to your nest to provision it, you've just lost everything. So uh, we actually, uh, most of these bees, what's really neat is, is you can pick them up. You can hold them in your hands and they will not sting you, especially if they're at flowers. So 70% of our bees, you talk about 4,000 species of bees, this is a lot, nest in the ground. And when they're nesting, these may look like ant nests, they may look like worm holes, but most of the years, you're not even going to, be able, going to be able to see them. But ground nesting is a very, very important resource to conserve if you're going thinking about native bees. About 30% of our species nest in, uh, traditionally nested in either hollow plant stems that they would dig out or old beetle burrow holes. These are when people see bee condos out there, these are the bees you're providing for. The orchard mason bee, the leaf cutter bee, some of our other uh, wood nesting bees that you can actually provide a uh, nest site for. And then we have our bumblebees. As I said, there's about 50 species of bumblebees. They live in social colonies. If you follow this around the, the very the top where she's underground, that's a single female. She goes and provisions a nest. She raises her first brood. Unlike honeybees that live year round, one female overwinters, one queen. She then finds a nest, often in an old, rodent burrow or some other sheltered place. She lays eggs, she provisions this nest. This is what in the talk yesterday morning that Peter was giving, early spring wildflowers are vital. She, we, we have evidence that the fecundity 
of a hive of bumblebees is directly tied to early season easy foraging of the bumblebees. So give her something to eat. She has babies, she raises those babies, from then on she stays in the hive and her daughters go out. Again, it's all females doing the work. Her daughters go out and help then provision the hive. These hives may get fairly big, 80, 100, 120. We've known of 200 individuals in a hive. At the end of the year, everybody dies, but some new females that are queens and some new males, they mate. And then the males die and the queens overwinter again. So late in the season is important for, for uh, these new females, for the new queens. Early in the season is important for the queens that have just overwintered. And bumblebees nest in existing cavities and rodent burrows. Messiness, I like to think. I've had them in my compost pile. Um, they were in the neighbor's bird house. Uh, they'll nest in a variety of places. And unless you're aggressive to them, if you find a nest, leave it. They won't sting you. Um, also, we're doing a citizen science project looking for nests. So if you know of bumblebee nests, please go to our website. We're trying to find out where these nests are and ideally um, uh, what species are making them so we can learn more about bees and where they nest. Butterflies need all the same things as bees, that diversity of flowers, but they don't live in nests. They uh, need host plants. So add caterpillar host plants to your garden if you want to encourage the butterflies. There are some great books out there. You can look up what butterflies are in your area, look up what they eat, and augment your habitat with that. This is from a publication that I helped write. And basically what this shows is that in many habitats, what I like to point out is you probably already have a lot of the resources for these bees. Um, a little bit hard to see, but and I can't even really see it on my screen, but it shows a crop field. Next to it, you've got wildflowers. You've got a nest block. Leaving old snags is important. Leaving bare ground for nesting. Start going out and looking in your local environments. I was, I'm staying at the Comfort Inn, uh, exciting place. <laughs> and, but out in the parking lot, they just, haven't, you know, it's not manicured grass. They've got some open ground, and I found ground nesting bees, as well as honeybees, all foraging on clover. So it is amazing if you start looking where, what you're going to find. And remember that bees and butterflies are adapted to uh, uh, live in uh, patchy habitats. You don't have to provide everything for these bees or butterflies. If you have a very little yard just providing the forage, making sure you don't use pesticides, that will help because they can fly. You know, they're not going to fly miles, but they can fly to get their different resources. And again, avoid using insecticides. Insecticides kill insects. And I've seen time and time again where people put in a wonderful garden and then they use insecticides, and it's baffles, baffling to me. What's a little bit more insidious now is that many big nurseries are using systemic pesticides on their plants so that those plants are not eaten by herbivores. So if you're interested in pollinator conservation, ask your nursery what they're using on their plants because you don't want to buy a poison plant and put it in your yard unknowingly that then is going to really harm the pollinators more than, uh, more than it helps. Also with these management needs, what I like to tell managers, and I do a whole talk to land managers actually on these issues where, you know, I've got multiple slides, but think about pollinators in your grazing plan. Think about when you're doing fire. Uh, if, if you're managing for endangered species, you can think about pollinators. It doesn't have to be the overriding issue, but make it a consideration. Because if you're doing plant polliné pollination, you should, or plant conservation, you should really be thinking about the pollinators. Fascinating to me, we reviewed a couple years ago a conservation plan for native plants in the Willamette Valley. And they didn't know what pollinated any of them. They used honeybees as a surrogate. 
And we actually, in just a minor literature review, were able to show that none of these plants were probably, most of them were not even visited by honeybees. One of them was a butterfly, most of them were, uh, two of them were bumblebees, and others were probably small native bees. So if you're doing plant conservation, think about the pollinators, because that's part of the, part of the mix. Now, I talked a bit of, before, you know, we talked about how important these things are, we've talked about their decline, we've talked about their concerns, we've talked about other considerations. Um, one other consideration to think about is that we, as bees decline, the need for bees is growing. From 1961 to 2006, the global acres of cropland required for bee pollination has tripled. And we are still relying on one species to pollinate the majority of our crops. And we really believe, and the evidence is now showing, we're working with scientists at UC Berkeley, UC Davis, University of Minnesota, Rutgers, um, and the list goes on and on, Michigan State University, uh, the University of Vermont. We are working with so many scientists and everything that we're seeing come out of the literature shows that if you provide significant habitat, you can get pollination service from native bees. And this is uh, something that has been replicated time and again in California. This is the Cape Valley. They get all of the pollination of watermelon because they have habitat for these species. Xerces is using this science and we're building uh, policy structure. So, uh, Xerces Society in 2008 was able to get language in the farm bill to support pollinator conservation on farms. This was huge because all of a sudden farmers can now tap into conservation dollars to put in pollinator habitat. And now we've reached over 10,000 farmers with education and instruction on how to put this habitat into the ground. And all of that together, we've been able to uh, support six, over 60,000 acres of habitat for pollinators. That both helps the diversity and abundance of pollinators themselves and help to stabilize our food supply. Also working on all of the at-risk pollinators that are out there as well. You know, everything from farm plantings in the Central Valley, um, you know, recreating uh, native-like meadows in what used to be farmland, you know, farm landscapes. To the California hedgerows we started creating in 2007. Um, we've now worked on cattle ranches, taking pastures that were almost all non-native grass and trying to make them so that they're forage for both the cows as well as for pollinating insects. Uh, field borders in pear orchards in Oregon. You can plant field borders and improve pollination of pears. Uh, in Florida on blueberry farms, putting insectary and wildflower uh, uh, plantings. Um, it's not just farms that can benefit diversity and that can benefit conservation. We're working with Minnesota's DNR on roadsides. We've already put in 3,500 acres of roadside habitats in Minnesota. And you would think that's, um, I don't know what happened. That goes on its own. Let's go back. You would think that it's odd to put roadsides habitat. Are they going to get squished? But there's actually good data that Bees and butterflies move less if they have intact habitat on the sides of roads and are less likely to be impinged. I love that word. That's the scientific word for squished. <laughs> impinged on a car if you have intact habitat than if you have weedy habitat. In weedy habitat, they're moving. They're trying to get resources, and so they end up in the road. In intact habitat, they move much less and are less likely to go out in the road. You can add another dimension and work on an endangered species and pollinators. As I said, we've created habitat for the Carner Blue Butterfly, a butterfly listed under the Endangered Species Act, uh, on dairy farms in, in uh, Wisconsin. And this is adjacent to crop fields, so you can both have uh, increased pollination and work to protect endangered species. And protecting rare habitat for 
for endangered species in Oregon and California and Washington from road from off-road vehicles overgrazing or encroachment this all helps the pollinators we may be focusing mostly on one species but the work we're doing is helping all and you can do fascinating things. My colleague, Mace Vaughn, this is his daughter's school, Sabin School. He found that on the baseball field, if you can look there, during the spring, when most people aren't, early summer, when most people aren't playing baseball, um, this is the largest aggregation of ground nesting bees that I have ever seen. And instead of the school taking in the knee-jerk reaction that, oh my goodness, we've got bees in the field and we've got kids, they're at risk. Um, luckily, they had Mace Vaughn, who runs my pollinator program there. Instead of that, he made it their mascot because the kids can go up and he's done many classes. They can pick these bees up. The bees get a little angry and so they, the kids were all calling them tickle bees. And he's made it the mascot of the school. And now they're planting pollinator gardens all around the school to help the bees that nest in the field. You can do all sorts of really cool things in all sorts of really cool habitats. And don't forget your small yard. It is one more piece of the puzzle. The more, as I said, the more habitat, the better the habitat, and the more closely aligned that habitat into uh, corridors or at least areas that can be flown to, the better this is going to be for pollinators in the face of climate change. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, what's fascinating to me is, you know, I like to think that I'm, you know, on the cutting edge of science. I'm talking about native bees and, you know, we should bring them back and we should use them for pollination. This is a, a brochure from the Soil Conservation Service, which became the Natural Resource Conservation Service from 1950. Years ago, wild bees did most of the pollinating. Oh, yeah, I guess we already knew that. Um, but basically, we've destroyed their habitat, and they're saying you can recreate their habitat and put them back in the system. Um, Dr. Edith Patch was potentially way, way before her time. By the way, I, uh, I ended with this slide at a keynote at the Entomological Society of America because Dr. Edith Patch was the head of the Entomological Society in 1938 when she said, um, uh, she predicted, I love this, that by the year 2000, the President of the United States would issue a proclamation claiming that land areas at regular intervals throughout the U.S. would be maintained as insect gardens under the direction of government entomologists. Wouldn't that be nice? These would be planted with a variety of plants to sustain populations of butterflies and bees. She predicted that sometime in the future, entomologists would be as much or more concerned with the conservation and preservation of beneficial insect life as they are now with the destruction of injurious insects. By the way, when I read that, I got stone silenced by the 180 people that were in that room because the Entomological Society of America still is much more concerned with injurious insects and working on pesticides than they are on conservation. Unfortunately, the words of a pioneering uh, head of the Entomological Society has not, has really not come uh, full circle. But you can help this happen. You can all be part of making Edith Patch's prediction a reality. And you can do it yourself on your own um, and, and really feel good about it. And you can, you can take our pledge which is just simply to protect and plant wildflowers, protect and create nest sites, avoid insecticides, and then spread the word, whether that is telling your neighbor, whether that is calling EPA and telling them they need to, uh, reg they need to regulate insecticides, uh, or whatever else you do. So you can do this, as I said, in ag area, if you're a park manager, uh, if you work for the Forest Service, but also you can do it in your front yard you can provide everything that these pollinators need. You can, you can protect existing nest sites. Start going out and looking at what is in your yard, what is in your park. 
and then go talk to the park manager and I, you know, let him know the resources that are there that they may be overlooking. And then especially avoid using pesticides, especially insecticides. What's fascinating about this picture, and uh, this picture has a bigger shot where there were 16 different products on the shelf. Of that, 15 of those had these systemic insecticides in them. And of those, not one had a warning label that these things kill bees or butterflies. Um, some of them actually have bees and butterflies on them. So go in, if you're going in, ask your, your garden center to not carry these. Or one of our campaigns, which we're working on with one of your fine senators from this state, Senator Boxer, is a right to know law that these chemical companies would have to actually put something on the labels that tells people that these kill bees and butterflies. So support that when you come out, get on our mailing list and we can let you, let you know how to support that. But also go in, ask questions of your nursery. They shouldn't be carrying these. Um, they shouldn't be using them on their plants. And join us in this effort. We've had thousands of people across the United States take the pledge and start to protect pollinators. We have all of the resources that you need. We've got our Attracting Native Pollinators book. I'll be signing copies out in the lobby afterwards, but we have a tremendous amount of other materials, including if you're a land manager or a farmer, we've got uh, technical materials that can really help you uh, understand how to do this, as well as materials about how you can get farm bill conservation money for doing this if you're a, a farmer or work with farmers. Our website, almost all of this, not the book, sorry, it's too big, but most of this is downloadable for free from our website as well. So you be part of the solution. Uh, anybody can do this. You can go out and take action. If we all take action, maybe by 2050, Edith Patch will be right. And we will have government entomologists who it's their job to conserve these important insects. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I guess we're going to take some questions, so if people want to go and line up at the microphone, if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Hi. So I have a garden at my house, and I try to be as organic as possible and not use, but then I realize that a lot of the organic products that I see are these harsh chemicals, like neem, for instance, which yes. has a warning on the label that says that this will interfere with bees. And so, it, in your opinion, is there something that is better to use on my vegetable garden that will also not invade on my uh, flower garden that yeah. will hurt the bees? Yeah, you know, when we, a couple of years ago, came out with a um, uh, paper uh, that kind of shook the organic industry up because we, this paper uh, lists all of the organic approved insecticides uh, some of them are highly toxic to bees and butterflies. Um, so ideally, there are, if you've got a garden, there are lots of times cultural practices that you can use, um, making sure that you're really waiting till the last minute. I mean, many times we see insects, injurious insects, insects that eat our plants, but they never reach populations that really harm our harvest. Um, also, some of these insects may just make some blemishes that you know we should just really live to learn with. So one, you can download uh, this information from our website on these organic uh, insecticides. We have some alternatives to use that are less, uh, less toxic. That said, generally, I would say, these organic approved insecticides, one thing that pretty much, and you never say always, but they break down more quickly in the environment than many of these synthetic insecticides. So for instance, the neonicotinoids that can last for years, uh, if you're using uh, pyrethrin, which is toxic, it's made out of chrysanthemums, and it is organic, it breaks down quite quickly in the soil. But 
I like to tell people to follow what's called integrated pest management. So basically, start watching your garden. You may get pests, you may just be able to squish them. When I get cabbage butterflies, you don't put anything on them, you just find them and you squish, some people don't like to squish them, put them in a bucket, do whatever you need to do to get rid of them. With aphids, often a strong stream of water. And there are some really good resources out there on the web for alternatives to any chemicals, cultural practices that would help you. So, so wherever possible, uh, look to those. Thank you. My other sure. question was with those systemic insecticides, is that related to the tobacco industry then? That they're... No, no. not related at all. Not okay. related at all. Um, for some years, uh, there have been a uh, class of insecticides that were actually based on nicotine. And this has just made them better through science. Okay. Uh, taking w the nicotine molecule and making it much more targeted uh, for insects and much more long-lived in the plant. So nothing, no, no relation to the tobacco industry. These are companies like Bayer, who make Bayer aspirin, but is the largest chemical company oh, in the okay. world, and Syngenta, who mm -hmm. we heard about yesterday, uh, as well as Monsanto. Those are the big companies. And my only other question is, um, when looking for bees grounding nests, because I've heard of these and I've looked for them, but I haven't really found them, and I'm wondering any like um, advice you can give on looking for these. Yes, um, start, most people don't look down. Just start <laughs> looking down, and if you see bees cruising near the ground, start trying to follow them, and oftentimes they'll lead you to these ground nests. If you're just looking at areas and then you go to another area and you look and you go to another area and you look, you know, these bees may either be out foraging, it may be the wrong time of year for them, but one of the things that I recommend is also start looking at your flowers. We have a citizen science uh, pamphlet that you can download from our website that basically recommends stations. You look for 15 minutes and you count the number of and different types of bees that uh, are on your flowers. Oftentimes you can follow a bee and start to see where they're going. And you know if they're flying over over by the fence you may be able to go over to the fence. They might be nesting in there or in the ground. Oh, so thank you very um, much. Keep your eyes open. Thank you. I feel that the term uh, weedy plants has a kind of negative connotation, but aren't most weedy plants just um, na like native undesirable angiosperms? Can you provide a disambiguation sure. between weedy plants and natives? Yeah, I try not to use the term weedy plants. Maybe I did in there, and I apologize if I did, because uh, you're right. Weedy plants are often, uh, a weed is just a plant out of place, actually. I guess I should have some definitions like he did yesterday. I recommend, you know, these areas that have weedy patches often can be really beneficial for, for bees, but what you have to watch out for is what are called noxious weeds or invasive weeds. Because often what happens is if there is one type of weed that takes over, it usually has a short blooming period and often it may provide pollen and nectar for that short blooming period but crowds everything out. So yes, weeds, weeds are just plants out of place and oftentimes someone's weed is another person's uh, a good bee plant. So great point. Um, I was just wondering if there's any research that shows that like genetically modified plants might be contributing to the like decrease in pollinators. You know, there's, I've worked on genetically modified plants and I see some real, real issues there with, uh, with GMO crops. Um, what's interesting, probably the best evidence we have has nothing to do with the plant itself. It has to do with Roundup Ready plants. Uh, what you can do is if you plant Roundup Ready plants, you can then use Roundup, which is a broad spectrum herbicide, much more liberally in and around plant fields. And what we've seen in the Midwest is an elimination of these weedy patches that we were just talking about because farmers are able to more liberally use these herbicides because what happens is the GMO plant, basically Roundup Ready means that you can spray Roundup on the soybeans 
if, you're, if it's soybeans. And it kills all the weeds around it, but not the soybeans. So there's definitely that. We've lost a lot of habitat because of GMO, because uh, of Roundup Ready. As for some of the other uh, things like, you know, BT corn, which is another, uh, they, they, the corn expresses Bacillus thuringiensis in its plant tissues, and Bacillus thuringiensis is a uh, toxin to Lepidoptera. Uh, what we see more is less of the issues with pollinators and more of issues with soil, soil uh, macroinvertebrates, because a lot of this is exuded from roots, uh, and these soil invertebrates are out of the way, and they're not as, I guess, sexy as the pollinators. So there are lots of adverse effects of GMO crops that um, uh, yet linking them directly to pollinator decline, the best way to do that is habitat loss. Yeah, I was curious, uh, so, you know, the, the honeybee is uh, non-native, but has any of your research shown you that, like, do they, does it impact negatively the native species, or is there any overcompetition or anything for resources? Yes. Yes and yes. Um, honeybees, especially if they're stocked at high levels, have been shown to negatively uh, impact native bees. And uh, they do that because one honeybee hive can have hundreds of thousands of individuals in it. And most native ecosystems don't have that many bees. So all of a sudden, there's much, much more competition uh, at sites. So there is some limited evidence that at high stocking levels, and I, I want to express that high stocking level. You having a hive in your yard is probably not causing this issue. Um, but at high stocking levels, there is some competition. What worries us more is that we're now starting to see some work come out of Penn State that shows that honeybees might be able to transfer some of their diseases to some of the native bees. So we're cautious with honeybees. They're hugely important for agriculture. We uh, want to figure out how to sustainably use honeybees in agriculture, so we're, we don't advocate against honeybees. But we, don't, we do advocate against honeybees being moved into wild areas, and moved into natural areas or other areas. In the ag landscape, in the urban landscape, um, you know, they've been here for years. They'll continue to be here for years. Um, also, I would contend I do get the question that should I keep honeybees to help pollinators? No, no, you shouldn't. Uh, you should keep honeybees if you want to have honey. It's great. I have friends and that, that have honeybees, and the honey from them is, is wonderful, and I've worked on honeybees in the past. You should keep honeybees if you want your kids to see really cool biology, because honeybees are really cool. If you want to help pollinators, you should plant a variety of mostly native plants. You should use, not use insecticides, and you should make sure you conserve nest sites. So hopefully that's an answer. One last thing is, with some specific endangered species, bees, honeybees do have a disproportionate effect. Um, they are listed, uh, the, the hyleus, which are the yellow-faced bees, Several of them were just listed in Hawaii due to our efforts, and honeybees are listed as a threat because the hyleus are so small that the honeybees uh, push them off of their flowers. Thanks. Yeah. 